Good morning, everybody. Thanks again for joining us at the People Summit. We're really happy to have you here. We have an exciting day of uh, presentations of people speaking from the heart about the places they'd love to see protected and that they cherish and want to see for their future generations. Um, I will note uh, the Habs won last night, so I just got to say that. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, that's just my little thrill of the morning. Uh, I will also say that we had an extremely spectacular day yesterday. We invited uh, Minister Karina Gould to speak yesterday. She did an amazing job and really walked us through why she is so passionate about coots to escarpment. We heard from many others talking about connectivity. We heard about Rondo, um, a whole bunch of conservation that's going on in, in my neck of the woods, the hometown that I grew up in, London, Ontario, Windsor. And today is no different. We're going to hear more about central Ontario and connectivity and maybe building uh, some some kind of connective corridor that takes you from the lake to Algonquin. We're going to hear more about Algonquin and we will also hear this morning about the partners that we have in Carolinian Canada and lands and waters all around us and uh, we're really excited to, to get to those stories but we're going to kick off the day with um, Elder Capriel who will open in a good way with a morning prayer and we will uh, get started with the, the, the last day of the summer which I can't believe we're already at. Um, but we have an exciting uh, lineup for you. I hope you can stay for the for the full day or check out some of the pieces along the way. And we will host all of this online afterwards once we get the video back up and going. And I would like to give a big shout out to all the groups that have helped make this happen, all of the presenters and the and the four co-hosts, the CPAWS Ottawa Valley, Wilderness Committee, Wildlands League and Carolinian Canada. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, Elder, please take it away. Uh -huh. I speak to everyone this morning from my home territory. I live in the islands and waters where I was born, Shawanaga Bay, Ontario. I invited first the spirits, the grandmothers and the grandfathers in by shaking this gift from creator, the shaker. In our cultural beliefs, when we gather at grand powwows, and I hope that most of you have come, and if not, it's an invitation to get the first one in the season. We have a protocol of the ask for the day. The first is the hearing of the drums, warm up is what they call it. Then there's an invitation to the grass dancers, the men to come and bless the grounds with their medicine way of dancing and their spirit words to let earth woman know and all living beings of what she holds, what it is that we are going to do there today. Gather, visit and walk away with good memories. So this day today is no different than that. In the process of the Eagle staffs and the flags of the territories and the colors that come into the grand entry through the grand entry, the invitation to come in. There are songs of acknowledgement. And this being technically the fourth day, because on Monday this week, the spirits were getting us ready. There was thunder, there was lightning, there was water falling from the sky world. There were messages, gifts going back and forth from creator to earth woman, earth woman to the sky people. Everything was getting ready to listen because they knew this gathering 
was about talking about visiting one another of your territories and the difficulties that we all face now, taking care of Earth Woman, that water, and all living things upon her. And back to the grand entry. There is a song set aside for the flags to acknowledge the flags of the territories, the Eagle Staffs. And it seems to me that no matter how windy the day is, during that song, that honoring, the wind seems to subside and just gently hold everything still. And what the elders tell us and the grandfathers tell us about that process, the natural process of spirit and recognition through that responsibility is that the spirits come in to listen to what it is that we are saying, what we are promising in our relationship. And once they've heard all of what the spirit of the people and the lands and the animals and the water of that territory, Chinodin comes, and that is the wind, and it lifts up, and the flags begin to dance. It is a natural process of knowing in the ask. Yesterday was very difficult in some places, listening to the young people and their passion from the rural territories of the bottom of Ontario to the northern places, how people are relating to the lands and waters, to the animals. We heard the passion of one woman that's standing, talking not about herself, but about the trees and the loss of life that is to come to a caribou herd. Eventually, they will not have food. They will not have a place to live. They will be lost. And the hard thing is, is that all those trees and their homelands are being traded for money. In the South, the recognition of trying to save small Greenland places is just as important as trying to save the stand tall brothers and sisters. I offer you courage. I offer you continued prayers for me so that you stand up and take care of what it is that you've been gifted to do. I'm going to offer a song for today and the forever. And I hope that each one of you will be able to grasp one word. The song is old comes from a long, long years of teaching and it was lifted up again by the late Dan Pine. Uh, it was gifted to him. And when it was gifted to him and he shared it out, it is up to us and responsible for gifting it on to you. Um
I hope that you talk with this one word, um, back. And I give you that strength to come, to stand up, um, back. This morning, it was very calm here on Nibe. It was so clear, the vision of the sky world and the ones that flew through. It acted as a, re, as a mirror, the reflections of the inside and out. So today, use your heart. Let it see what's inside of you and let that come out through that vessel, that voice. That's what the birds do. Okay, let's have a good day, a good celebration. And I wish everyone happiness. Only happiness in your families. How many good. Elder Capriel, we have been truly blessed to have you with us each and every day. And um, your words this morning, especially touched on the, literally on the heart of the matter. Thank you for your song and thank you for your words to open today. Now I invite uh, the moderator and all the speakers who are uh, are here. We have uh, Liz Hendricks from WWF uh, moderating this morning's session and she'll take it from here. Thank you so much, Elder Capriel. That was um, a beautiful way to start our day. I really appreciate your presence here. Um, before, uh, excited for this morning's speakers. We have a long list and it's exciting, great information. Um, I'm really excited for today's session because I really do believe um, how we impact the land in turn impacts the waters and um, how the waters interact with us. We have six speakers who will share their stories. Um, and the longer bios are on the website. So please refer to that, but I will introduce each speaker as we go. I do have the tough job of being the timekeeper. So I will, you know, pull the proverbial hook for folks speaking. Um, and for those watching, please post your Q questions. We will have a Q&A period. If we don't get to them, we will make sure and questions are answered in the follow-up packages that go out. Um, with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Tamara Stomp, who is part of the local action group, Western Lake Erie Basin National Marine Conservation Area. Tamara, please take it away. Good morning, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for the invite. Um, uh, it's a great crowd of people that I'm amongst. I've um, been asked to present on our project, which is the proposed National Marine Conservation Area for the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Essentially, uh, on the map that's going to be shown on the next slide, you'll see that uh, it, it goes in the red spot, so the red lines, which is uh, a somewhat fluid, but is about 150,000 hectares. It is, stems from the east side of Leamington, which is Point Pelee, 
and all the way to Colchester in the west. On the west, you see uh, the white line, which is also extends along the bottom as the U.S. boundary. So it encompasses the islands of Pelee Island. And uh, I'm from Kingsville on there, which is the uh, supposed to be the most southern point in southern town in Canada. Not the southern point, because that would be Pelee Island or Point Pelee on the mainland. But on the left, you see it going up into the Detroit River. And uh, of course, this basin catches everything from the Sarnia Chemical Companies through the Detroit, um, Michigan um, um, sector of uh, the Lake Great Lakes, where they uh, have all their uh, Zug Island is one of the ones that has a lot of uh, chemicals. And it all comes down and gets kind of stuck in the lowest part of the Lake Erie right here in uh, our region. So we're very concerned about it. Um, next slide, please. So um, this was first identified as a possible area of concern that could uh, benefit from the designation in a 1997 Parks Canada study done by the University of Waterloo. And so it was considered an outstanding natural area with historic Canadian, Canadian significance. And um, next, pass, next one, please. It, next slide, please. So there's a number of reasons why. First of all, it uh, has a great geological background. Point Pelee's got 14 kilometers of dunes, bluffs, submerged moraines, and wetland complexes. Um, bi biologically, there's 141 species of fish, including the significant spawning and habitat areas of pickerel, which the U.S. call walleye and yellow perch. The vegetation is aquatic, and it is the uh, Carolinian forest species, and it has a number of provincially significant wetlands with many rare species. Um, you heard yesterday from uh, MP Brian Massey about the Ojibwe shores with its many rare species. That's just around the corner, up to uh, de up to uh, Detroit, uh, up the Detroit River. And and uh, the aquatic mammals are many, 46 wild animal species within 10 kilometers of the shoreline. Next, please. So most importantly, in my view, is uh, one of the characteristics of it, which is that um, the main characteristics of this area is that we're the flight path, the confluence of the uh, uh, Mississippi and Atlantic Flyway for the songbirds, warblers in the spring and fall, swallows in July, fall shorebirds, hawks, raptors in September, waterfowl, including tundra swans in October and November. Uh, they've distinguished bats lately, uh, monarch butterflies, as you know. We got really upset when they didn't come in as many numbers that uh, one of the years a couple of years ago and uh, I'm from Kingsville the home of Jack Miner and the Canada Goose all of us wanted to be the Goose Queen in the Kingsville Parade when we were growing up in high school so that's how important this uh, this all is to us all right now um, um, Jack Miner is just down the street from me um, where I live in Kingsville so this is an important area uh, that has is the resting and feeding watering and breeding habitat for all the birds that uh, come from the north uh, down to the south on their annual run. Next please. So there's significant archaeological sites here too. You know that the Fathom 5 uh, park in Tobermory um, has a lot of sunken ships. Well we've got more than uh, many many um, not only are there indigenous sites here that have been identified all the way back to 900 AD, but the shipwrecks, because of the sanding, sand, the shifting sandbars and the unforgiving storms that we have, um, about 500 vessels are estimated to have been sunk around here in what's called the Pelee Passage, the, uh, the area between, um, um, point, uh, between Pelee Island and our mainland, um, where a lot of the U.S. ships go right straight through, have uh, happened since 1770. 79, so there's about 51 ships that have been identified for unique diving experiences. Um, this is this is just an um, offshoot um, business right now, but could be developed for more tourism. Um, commercial fishing is big here. We have approximately two-thirds of the total Canadian Great Lakes catch. And uh, we have many recreational beaches along the way. Um, this used to be the place where the Americans had all their cottages along the shorelines uh, in, in the old days. The old days is only back to the 1960s and 50s. Uh, and, and further than that, they came here from Detroit and um, spent the summers. This was their cottage territory. Next, please. So a big 
difficulty right now is water quality. There's three municipal water intakes that are challenged by the increased demand from greenhouses and residential development. So we have problem pollution sources of the algal blooms, uh, the agricultural and storm water runoff, malfunctioning septic systems and discharges from food and fishing fish processing plants. Um, there's a, a, a Sturgeon Creek um, on Point Pelee uh, site that was uh, once billed as having the, the most heavy metal count uh, as any creek that they could find in Ontario. So that's just lovely, isn't it? So we're really concerned about um, preserving um, the, the, the animals, the birds. Uh, the birds should not be uh, flying down here just to stop over before they get south on their trip um, to drink from um, a cesspool of Lake Erie. And we've had the uh, green block uh, algal blooms in the last number of years really bad they got better last year and we're waiting to see what happens this year but um, it's a very important area that um, needs assistance um, we are right across from Ohio which again is in a, a large industrial uh, and agricultural area we are also uh, the Sun Parlor of Canada where we have uh, um, our build as great uh, land that was very uh, fruitful and promising and now it's all covered with greenhouse glass and they're uh, putting pressure on the water intake system so there's a, a concern from the residents that they're paying water taxes and, and service fees for supplying the greenhouses. And um, we used to have a night sky, but now we don't have a night sky because uh, it's, it looks like the, uh, better than the Aurora Borealis, and that is from greenhouse lights. So it's been quite, quite a ride that we've been having. And uh, Tuesday, um, they just announced that we now have forever, uh, they found forever chemicals in Lake Erie from rainwater. Um, because we're a low-lying area that is surrounded on three sides by Great Lakes water and has some um, uh, air, land, and sea pollution. So um, this little section here is um, very important to preserve. And since I grew up on Lake Erie and uh, have an affection for it, I remember the times when the smelt used to jump right at you off the uh, coast of uh, the Point Pelee and you would collect them to eat. Um, that has been long, long gone. Many traditions have been long gone. And of course, we have the usual plastics crisis uh, in the water. So um, I think it's very important and we need to move forward with uh, designating it for some help. So next slide, please, is how do you do that? Well, of course, you know that the legislation was talked about in 1986, finally came to fruition in 2002. And uh, the purpose is to protect and conserve the lakes. There's currently five. Um, national marine conservation areas. I've listed them there and uh, I, I was listening to the um, Mushkigwuk um, present on their area in James Bay and uh, they were talking about the fact that they have a lot of um, waterfowl there that go south and they drive, they fly right by my house <laughs> on the way to uh, further south. So next slide please. Um, there's other ones in progress. Um, I've listed the Mishkigo book, and uh, also I hope it's the Western Lake Erie Basin in Southwestern Ontario. Next slide. So how do you do all this is uh, there's many steps and they have changed over the years. Uh, this was started a long time ago by a, a bunch of people who were really concerned about wind turbines being in a shallow lake with the wind turbine well, uh, movement would change the ice patterns which would change the sand shifting and which would therefore impact not only our archaeological and natural sites but also houses on the shore. So we have already gathered letters of support from local politicians and relevant stakeholders. I think that's usually step one. Um, we've had our dialogue with the local parks authorities who are supportive but indicate clearly that you have to um, make sure that the local indigenous authorities are notified and receive their support. So we're working on that with our Caldwell Nation and uh, we have to establish a committee of the key stakeholders to who asked to complete the feasibility study and negotiate the agreement to the establishment of all this. Uh, I see online there's a lot of documentation that you can now follow that will help you if you're trying to do this for your own areas. 
much more than there was um, in the early 2000s when we were talking about this. It's a long process. It takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of consultation. So uh, I love our elders' uh, comments this morning to have perseverance. And, um, and so I'm waiting for the 101 more hoops that we might have to jump to get there, but we'll hopefully get there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, that's really inspiring and what a beautiful region. So I totally appreciate uh, the efforts. Um, next, we have Michelle Cantor. Michelle is the Executive Director of Carolinian Canada and will speak to us about big picture protected area inv and investment opportunity. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Liz, and welcome everyone. It's very exciting to be here. Um, just checking that you can hear me because I don't seem to be popping up on screen. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just dive right in. How do we do protected areas on a really complex landscape of Southern Ontario? I'll share a little bit about what I know about the from the Carolinian zone perspective and part of the Southern Ontario Nature Coalition. Next slide, please. Um, so, Southern Ontario is a critical yet neglected piece of our protected area network. Shockingly, this region has only 0.6% protected area, according to the Auditor General. This is far below the 17 to 30% recommended by the United Nations and embedded in Canada Target One. We're home to 40% of Canada's biodiversity, so we can't use the excuse that these ecosystems are represented elsewhere. And with climate change, species at the northern edge of their ranges and habitat networks are becoming even more important to protect biodiversity. There are many reasons to urgently reverse the trend of habitat loss. Next slide, please. But can it be done in Southern Ontario? How do we go from less than 1% to 17%, let alone 30 by 30? But so Carolyn Canada recently completed a big picture protected area strategy with a task force that was an eye opener. Yes, it's complex. Yes, it's a challenge, but the multi-partner task force showed that all the key ingredients are in place to accelerate hundreds of potential protected area opportunities on our doorstep. Next slide. Our renewed big picture strategy and theory of change identified three strategic levers. First, healing landscapes starts with supporting Indigenous leadership, not just identifying what needs to be done and asking for First Nations partnerships. Listening to First Nations is first, first is shifting the paradigm, creating two-eyed seeing, healing communities, and growing hope for restoring our future by 2030. Ultimately, we are stronger together. This is a journey that we need to explore together. Indigenous protected and conserved areas are happening in Southern Ontario and many more could. Many examples are at this summit and in this session. <laughs> Next slide, please. Our second le lever is that we can expand opportunities with an inclusive and equitable approach for healthy landscapes, to strengthen networks of diverse private landowners that steward 95% of the landscape. From growing their first native plant to stewardship projects engaging landowners, engaging landowners starts long before a land donation or easement takes place. Growing a culture of nature was identified by the Big Picture Protected Area Task Force as a fundamental step to increase protected areas. Our In the Zone program shows that 25,000 hectares are available now for habitat improvement. This work in itself could support 14 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and kickstart a green economy, as well as identifying candidate P protected areas. Next slide, please. Third, strategic invest, the third lever is strategic investment. We can leverage significant support, especially in the ecoregion that 25% of Canadians live. Caroling Canada and partners recently launched the Deshcan ZB Conservation Impact Bond for healthy landscapes that includes protected areas. You're going to hear from um, Annabelle later 
uh, about the some of the context from the Chippewas per perspective of of what needs to be done in traditional territories. That led to this model and current research shows that people and businesses are ready and time is right to invest in nature. Next slide, please. An investment tool like the bond can build collaboration across diverse communities, connect around shared goals and diversify local economies, but only if conservation sectors and indigenous communities lead the way. We can't just leave it to business alone. According to the United Nations, 50% of the world economy is land-based. Without targeted investment, Southern Ontario will continue to bleed natural capital, putting wildlife, people, and future economies at risk. Next slide, please. The conservation impact bond model can help accelerate thousands of opportunities to build a strong protected areas network in Southern Ontario. Whether we use the bond or something else, there are many opportunities from municipal parks and land trusts to conservation easements. Next slide, please. Just highlighting a few examples, conservation easements can empower private landowners and businesses to protect agriculture productivity alongside biodiversity. Next slide, please. Conservation authorities are the largest protected area landowner in the Carolinian zone, the second largest in the province and their community gems. For instance, Rock Glen is part of Asabo Bayfield's 9,000 acres of protected area. Carol Conservation authorities are essential to healthy and safe landscapes. Protected areas on a private landscape takes a patient and strategic commitment over time to secure sites cost effectively when they become available. Conservation authorities are well positioned in local communities to leverage local protection opportunities for many co-benefits, especially related to water, climate, risk, and recreation. Next slide, please. The new report from the Southern Ontario Nature Coalition shows that there's huge opportunity, hundreds and thousands of hectares for more protected land in the greater Golden Horseshoe alone, including some that are already unceded crown lands. Next slide, please. Along with many, many other co-benefits, protected areas are critical as living seed banks and carbon storage for future generations. The backbone of healthy ecosystems is native plants and demand for local seed is growing. Southern Ontario seed strategy is emerging, which can help to incentivize landowners to protect and steward healthy habitat. For example, the pilot bond included a Thames Talbot project, and you'll hear from Daria later, to transition traditional farmland to native plant seed cropping. When you do the math, protected areas can support a local green economy in many ways. Next slide, please. So how do we put it all together? The big picture healthy landscape strategy connects new opportunities to priority ecological targets for strategic investment. Each site has a role to play either in the park system or in the greater park ecosystem to boost ecological integrity and climate resilience. New tech ne networking platforms like In The Zone help to accelerate these connections. Next slide, please. On the ground, the healthy landscape strategy becomes a portfolio of action for an investment tool like the Conservation Impact Bond to accelerate and strengthen protected areas on a complex landscape as a part of a continuum of action. Next slide, please. Yes, it's a challenge, but yes, it can be done. There are many protected area opportunities that are investment ready. Look at all the stories in this summit. We can save healthy landscapes if we want to, but we need to see the opportunity on our doorstep and work together quickly. You are part of this story. What do you see that needs protection? How much should we save for future generations? Share your story and save your place for a healthy green future. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. I really love that there's more than one way to look at protection. It's a really um, inspiring approach and I think empowers a wide diverse group of people, wider diversity of people. Next up, so thank you so much for that. And next up, Annabelle Lauren, environmental technician with Chippewas of the Thames River First Nation. I'm looking forward to one hearing from you. I've never met you before. Nice to meet you. 
Nice to meet you too. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, my name is Annabelle, and today I'll be talking about Deshkan Zebing and continuing conservation. Next. Deshkan Zebing means along the Antler River and refers to Chippewas of the Thames First Nation. Deshkan Zebi is the name for the Thames River and is in reference to how the river forks in London, but also to the antlered or horned serpent that is known to live in the water river. We're an Ojibwe community, part of the Three Fires Confederacy, which is a political alliance with the Potawatomi and Ottawa. Our traditional territory spans southwestern Ontario, along with present day Michigan and Ohio. We refer to this territory as the Wawea Tanong or Round Lake, which is in reference to Lake St. Clair. We're signatory to several pre-confederation treaties, meaning that our treaties were signed with the British Crown rather than Canada. Today, our reserve is located on the north banks of Deshkanzibi with a population of around 1,000 people living on reserve and 2,000 people living off of the reserve. Next. This is a map that we use in our consultation protocol. It shows our traditional territory, which is the red lines, and then the colorful polygons are different treaty territories. The orange, multiple orange areas are different First Nations communities and the blue arrow points to Chippewa. Um, one treaty that's of special significance to Chippewa is the yellow polygon. Um, that is the Longwoods Treaty and it's significant because um, we are the sole signatories to this treaty. Next. Our treaty and traditional territories include numerous watersheds. And although we signed treaties, we never gave up our responsibilities to be caretakers for these lands and waters. That means we have an interest in all the activities and projects occurring throughout the Great Lakes Basin. Next. Activities occurring in the Thames River watershed um, are of particular interest to us. We work to actively participate in any and all projects that could have an impact on the river. This includes working with the upper and lower Thames conservation authorities, as well as the city of London. We work to bring a more holistic perspective to river governance and in part that you can't segregate certain activities, projects or regions because of the cumulative effects on the whole system. Next. This is a map of Chippewa at the community level. So the white parcels are Chippewa land. Um, the yellow area closer to the left is Muncie Delaware Nation and to the right is Oneida Nation of the Thames. This is a unique situation because there's three nations living in very close proximity to each other. The Anishinaabe, Lenape and Haudenosaunee. Despite being three distinct nations with different cultures, language, traditions, and history, we do work together on environmental activities. Next, please. I work for the Treaty Lands and Environment Department, and we cover a lot of different areas, but what brings us together is the land. So we have a treaty research unit that works on community history and land claims research. We have a certified lands manager who is working to develop a land code that would operate under the First Nations Land Management Act. We have a consultation unit that works with proponents to implement the federally mandated duty to consult and accommodate. And then the environment department that works at the treaty and traditional territory level, watershed level and community level. Next. This is a historical map that shows some of the departmental overlap. So this map um, is from the mid 1800s and shows where an Indian agent had created a series of land parcels for Chippewa members to settle on. In the lower left area, you can see these parcels very congregated together um, and we call this area the flats today. Um, our members were smart and knew that this was a floodplain and no one has actually settled there. Um, next, please. Uh, Chippewa has a very active water monitoring program. Um, these pictures are of summer students who went out electrofishing and water sampling. The department has been benthic sampling every spring and summer, or spring and fall, since 2015. 
Um, we also do water quality and quantity monitoring, and we're currently working to acquire the correct equipment and complete training so that all this work can be done in-house. Our water sampling focuses mainly on the Thames River and the three main tributaries that flow through the community. And we're also working to create an agricultural management plan and completing a floodplain mapping project, which kind of stems off of these water monitoring projects or program. Next. These are some pictures of different projects or programs that we're, we've worked on in the past. Um, the large picture on the left is of an agricultural field, and we worked with Alternative Land Use Services, or ALICE, and the Lower Thames Conservation Authority to plant a five-acre prairie buffer around the farm field. So we chose this location to create a farm uh, buffer between the farm field and the river to create prairie habitat and to mitigate erosion. So it's just between the bare area and the vegetated area on that photo. Um, the top right-hand photo is of a community member. Um, he worked, or he helped us with the Anishinaabek Ontario Fisheries Resource Program or Center project, where we looked at contamination in fish. And the bottom picture is a Thames River cleanup, where staff and community members paddled down the river, cleaning up garbage along the way. Next. Um, much of the work completed in our department is with the support of outside partners. Collaboration is something that we believe strongly in, and it's a very long process that does not happen overnight. So the first step is relationship building. We take the time to learn about the organizations and we learn where each other are coming from so that we can have this foundation. Um, during this relationship building process, trust, trust is built um, through the open and honest communication. It's essential to meaningful and long-standing relationships. And through the process of both relationship building and trust, the collabor collaboration far exceeds the objectives of the initial project, which is really exciting. Next. These satellite images show what Chippewa looks like compared to the surrounding land uses. Um, we're located in a primarily agricultural landscape just downstream of a large city, of the city of London. And you can see how dense the green and forested area is compared to the surrounding region. Um, through monitoring and our species inventories, we know that we have a large number of species at risk that call Chippewa home. As the surrounding land continues to develop, we're noticing an increase in these species. Chippewa is confined to a land base with the growing populations. And while we continue the environment, there's a competing land use interest in the community. Through community engagement and land use planning, we know that the top two concerns of the community are housing and the environment. So we're trying to balance these two interests with our land. Next, please. Some of our conservation work includes protecting 250 acres of land in our community, even though we did not receive the federal funding for the Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas Program. This land includes a large forested area, prairie habitat, and a wetland. This amount of land is very significant when considering the amount of available banned land and the current competing interest that I mentioned earlier with housing. The image on the left shows a nature trail that we built behind the elementary school, and we're currently looking at developing a language and land-based learning opportunity that would be implemented hopefully in the fall when we come back to school. We also have completed a multi-year species at risk inventory 27 species at risk were identified, primarily reptiles and birds, and we're hoping to continue more of the species at risk work in the future, as well as including habitat protections and restorations. Just this past spring, we did a community tree distribution. 1,800 trees were ordered, and even though we limited the amount of trees that each member could take, we were out of trees within a few hours, which was a pleasant surprise. And as mentioned on the previous slide, collaboration is critical for the success in our work. Um, some of the projects we're currently collaborating on include the Conservation Impact Bond with Carolinian Canada, Thames Talbot Land Trust, Burge Capital, and Ivy School of Business. And we're also working on a floodplain mapping project with the Lower Thames Conservation Authority and Cambium Indigenous Professional Services. Next. 
Through the Thames River Clearwater Revival, the Antler River Guardians of the Four Directions arose. This is a First Nations Youth Environmental Stewardship Program that aims to connect youth with different environmental learning opportunities through Southwestern Ontario. It's been incredibly impactful learning for both the youth and the Thames River Clearwater Revival Steering Committee who have championed this initiative. Hopefully this year we'll be able to bring this project or this program back with COVID precautions in place and that's currently in the planning process. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to highlight another collaborative project that we worked um, with our neighboring First Nations communities. It's a Tri-Nation Source Water Protection Project that we worked on with Canadian Environmental Law Association. Um, Chippewa, Muncie, and Oneida worked collaboratively on this project that was aimed at protecting our drinking water. Next. We are looking forward to building new relationships, strengthening our current partnerships, and working collaborative on future environmental projects. Thank you so much, miigwech. Thank you so much, Annabelle. It's really inspiring, and even seeing the history, um, those historical maps, and how the Thames First Nation, um, the Chippewas, worked on the land long before, um, you know. Westerners and settlers started piecemealing it up. So thank you for that. So Daria Kosinski is the executive director of the Thames Tabit Land Trust and looking forward to hearing your discussion on nature conservation opportunities in a biodiversity hotspot. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And um, some of my early slides have already been spoken to by a few speakers. So I'll probably go through those a little bit quicker. Um, since we all kind of know what we're talking about here and the need for protection um, for the landscapes that we love. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I'm coming to you from Thames Talbot Land Trust. We are a land trust um, primarily uh, working on land conservation projects um, in our area. And we're really um, interested in preserving biodiversity for the long term. So our work is really permanent protection, and that's uh, a critical piece of why we, how we contribute to protected areas um, in Ontario. Next, please. So we've talked a little bit about protected areas, and I know many of you have seen some of these uh, slides before. So we know we have protection targets for Canada, and this is um, a, a big overview map um, of where the, most of the protected areas lie. And if you look down to Southern Ontario, where we um, are based, you will see that it's looking pretty blank down there. Um, next slide, please. And one of the critical things that we are concerned about is that when we look at percentages, what we're not always covering is the actual protected areas by eco region or representation. And one of the biggest concerns is that some of the highest biodiversity is in the south, and yet it is very much underrepresented in protected areas across Canada. Next slide, please. So Michelle's touched a lot about um, the Carolinian zone already. Um, and then we know that very little of that area is currently protected. Some of that is counting because usually only provincial or national parks have been counted and other partners uh, protected areas have not been included in those counts. Um, but part of it simply is that there just isn't very much land that's protected in this area. But we know that this is an area that has extremely high biodiversity and it's also very highly threatened. So we have a lot of pressures on the land um, that are competing uses um, and that for many generations now have actually, the land has really been um, exploited for productivity of other kinds of um, work. So we know we have lots of productive farmland, we know we have lots of industry, um, and that has really taken precedent and resulted in a lot of the fragmentation of habitats that we see down here. As Michelle also mentioned, we have um, a lot of private land ownership in this area, so it's very difficult to just get a large swath of land that could be protected. Um, so the work down here really is focused on a very different um, way of doing uh, protection. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Thames Tabo Land Trust is a land trust. Um, and really, we are one of many land trusts across Ontario. And you've probably heard from several of them already um, in this uh, summit, so I won't go too much about it. But uh, Ontario land trusts are working really hard to protect land across Ontario. And right now, about 30 active land trusts are protecting more than 43,000 uh, hectares of land. So it's a big contributor to the protection um, across Ontario. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we have often talked about and that some, um, one of our supporters has done some math about um, 
how do land trusts work and how do we protect biodiversity and, and is that really a good investment? Um, and the reality is that you do get a lot more biodiversity um, by working or doing land protection through land trusts compared to other mechanisms. Um, we know that federal and provincial protected land is very much concentrated in the north. Um, all those maps indicate that very clearly. There are very few provincial or national parks in the south and if they do exist they're quite small. But we know that the biodiversity is in the south in the Carolinian zone. So we know that we have this uh, difference in where we have a lot of biodiversity versus where a lot of the um, government type of protection is happening. Next slide, please. So one of the comparisons that we um, have done a couple times is to compare um, a typical provincial park in the north um, to something like a nature reserve that is managed and stewarded by Thames Talbot Land Trust. And in one of these, which is over a million acres in size, um, if you look at the number of species per acre, it is far lower than the number of species that are protected by a small nature reserve in the Carolinian zone that is managed by Thames Talbot Land Trust. So when we invest in biodiversity, when we protect in the south, we're actually protecting more species and more biodiversity for every acre that we protect, even if that total acreage is much smaller. Next slide, please. So we know Southern Ontario land trust can protect more species per acre and usually more species per dollar. Um, we are leveraging a lot of volunteer support and a lot of other um, innovative ways of funding our work. So there's just so much more that we can do. And we know lots of research has shown that we can't wait or depend on just national and provincial parks to protect um, areas of land that we love. They're just not going to be able to um, do that and especially not in the south. So land trusts really fill a substantial conservation gap. And as an example, in Elgin County, one of the areas that we work in, um, there are only three provincial parks uh, for a total of just over 700 acres of land that they protect. There are no national parks. In Elgin County, Thames Talbot Land Trust protects seven nature reserves with over 700 acres of land. So in Elgin County, we are one of the major players of protection for land um, across that county. Next slide, please. So our land trust has been around since the year 2000, um, and we have, as Michelle mentioned, often worked very piecemeal in small parcels over time. So over the last um, about 20 years, we have increased the amount of land that we protect. Um, and you can see that these dots are you know, far between in some cases um, and moving very slowly up the scale of how much land is protected. Um, and you can see in the last few years, those dots are piling up on top of each other. We, used to have potentially opportunities to protect one nature reserve a year or every other year, whereas now we're doing two or three per year. The demand and the increase in interest for nature conservation is really growing in Southern Ontario. Next slide, please. So currently uh, we protect 750 hectares of land, so that's almost 1900 acres um, across 20 different nature reserves um, in the area that we work. And we are home to more than 50 species at risk across these nature reserves. So we're providing homes to some of the rarest um, species that are need protection desperately um, in Southern Ontario. Next slide, please. And one of the focal areas where we work um, is Skunk's Misery Natural Area. Um, so if you haven't been to this area, it is lovely, even if the skunks um, are actually miserable from all the mosquitoes, um, but really you can't beat the diversity um, of, this, of this area. Um, for Southern Ontario, it is one of the biggest and largest significant forested blocks in the Carolinian region. Um, it probably is still not as big as the lands protected by Chippewas of the Thames lands, um, but it's one of the most um, sort of intact landscapes that are left um, outside of those protected by Indigenous um, communities. So Skunk's Misery is about 3,600 hectares in total. It has many different designations. Um, it's a Carolinian Canada site. It has provincially significant wetlands. Um, it contains an area of natural and scientific interest. It's an important bird area. It really is a biodiversity hotspot for Southern Ontario. Um, and although you can see in this map, the outline in red shows the, the entire area. Um, and then in orange, you can see the, um, the natural area the, of scientific interest. You can see that the different colored areas are actually lands that are protected by different organizations. So Thames Talbot Land Trust now has several nature reserves within that focal area that we protect, and then other conservation organizations like the county and the conservation authority um, have been also working in that area to protect land. So between the three organizations, nearly 30% of that area is now protected. So we are really um, excited that 
you know, working together and collaboratively and even in small parcels at a time, we can really build a core area of, of nature that's protected for the long term. Next slide, please. Many of uh, Thames Tower Land Trust nature reserves have been submitted to the Canadian Protected and Conserved Areas database um, earlier this year to be recognized as protected areas. Um, as I mentioned to date, many protected areas have only been counted if they are national or provincial parks um, and other areas have not been actually involved in, in that counting. Um, so some of that is, as I mentioned, under representation of actual groups that are doing lots of work to protect land, um, but have not been counted as part of the database. Um, so we're waiting to hear, um, but many land trust um, properties and, and nature reserves are often included um, because some of the ways that we operate and the bylaws and commitments that we have indicate permanent protection. So we are able to make that promise of forever. In addition, because of the area that we work in, um, we are providing ecosystem services and connection to nature for local communities. We're, uh, you know, we, London is included in one of, in our area as, long, uh, as well as many rural communities um, that all depend on access to nature and being able to connect with land and really build that relationship. And we know we saw in the pandemic a really big increase in people spending more time in nature. Um, and we really know how important that is. Um, and I think we're learning a lot from our Indigenous partners about why connecting with land and having a love for that land really means a lot to people's mental health and well-being and really to all of our futures. So being able to have these protected areas um, can really provide opportunities for so many people um, where many of Canadians, you know, 25% of Canadians live in this area. Um, so they need access to nature to be able to have that relationship, to build that love and to be able to continue protection uh, for future generations. Next slide, please. So basically we have to do more and we have to do it faster. We know that we're at a critical point where we're losing biodiversity very quickly, especially in Southern Ontario where there are continuing pressures for land. Um, so we uh, really, our pillars at Thames Tabula Land Trust are to protect um, important habitats that support biodiversity and species at risk. Um, they also are the same places that fight climate change and provide for people. Um, our second pillar is to restore, so to create more habitats to support nature and people. On some of our nature reserves, we've done restoration projects to expand the areas of natural habitat, some of which were um, supported by the uh, Deshkan Bibi Conservation Impact Bond. And our last one is nurture, um, really nurturing that connection to nature and land. We really believe that people need to spend time in nature, to fall in love with nature, to understand how important it is to their well-being. Um, if they don't know it, they, they can't love it. And if they don't love it, they're not going to protect it. So that's really an important part of the work that we do. Next slide, please. So how do we do this faster? Um, on this landscape, really the funding and capacity is limiting the amount of land that can be protected. You heard Michelle speak about all the possible opportunities and all the things that could be done, the willing landowners, we are turning away landowners because we don't have capacity or funding to protect all the land that could be protected. Um, we are working in a region where land prices are high. So if we're looking at acquisitions, that is a very expensive proposition. Um, the parcels are small, so they're all very much small piecemeal um, things that add up over time, but need to be done as separate transactions. And you need multiple partnerships to be able to do some of this work. Um, but at this same time, this, we know biodiversity is so high here. And if we want to protect biodiversity in Canada and in Ontario, we really have to invest in biodiversity protection in the south. Um, this is where so many of our remnant um, habitats are left that we can't repl replace. We can't, they're not represented in other parts of this country. Um, and because these are often at the northern range, um, of, um, at the northern end of their range, they really um, are the genetic potential for expansion with climate change and for that resilience that we're looking for. So this is really an area that um, needs investment and that we need to do more work in. So um, next slide, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daria. It's so inspiring, I think, also to see the network that happens when you collaborate with different organizations. I think it can be a really um, thrilling opportunity to see how much, yes, the parcels are small, but when groups are working together, that can build up very quickly. So really, thank you for that time. Next up, Chief Duncan from the Big Tigong Nishnabeg um, Nation in Lake Superior. Oh, my, where I used to live, Lake Superior is where I grew up. So I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Chief Duncan. 
a beautiful country. Well, I, I always claim that the North Shore of Lake Superior is the best place to live in the entire world. So there. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about our land claim because I think that we have to put in context what we're trying to do in regards to the protection of our waterways and trying to create uh, spaces uh, uh, for the protection and uh, ongoing, uh, uh, I guess, uh, saving of the caribou. So uh, I'll go to a little bit of the context of the land claim. Uh, next slide. That, that photo basically is my grandfather on Mountain Lake in 1930. And uh, we have a land-based uh, learning program in our elementary school. And we also take our high school kids out uh, uh, periodically. We haven't been doing that now uh, uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah, we had plans last summer, but we, we had to cancel those. Uh, so we get out quite often uh, with the youth and uh, uh, with the elementary school kids. We also, you see that sign, uh, we also have uh, embarked on a, 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 a project to clean out all porridge trails on all the traditional uh, canoe routes. So next slide. This, this basically is the uh, timeline in regards to our land claim. Uh, uh, in the early 70s, we found out uh, through research that we were not signatories to any treaty whatsoever. Uh, we didn't sign the Robinson Superior Treaty. So we launched a, a Aboriginal title land claim. And uh, in 1982, uh, Big Tagong and uh, other Lake Superior Anishinaabe gave the Crown notice uh, about the Aboriginal title claim. There's uh, five other communities along with us. Uh, there were two others, but they dropped out. Uh, uh, then in 1984, Beek the Gong and the other Anishinaabe communities filed a claim uh, alleging the existence of their Aboriginal title. In 1995, Beek the Gong filed a separate comprehensive Aboriginal title claim with Ontario and Canada. And in 2003, Beek the Gong launched its title claim and Ontario Superior Court uh, because they wouldn't recognize uh, the government, uh, sorry, the federal government wouldn't recognize our claim. So we took them to court. And then 2010, uh, Justice McCartney ordered that the uh, Bictagon claim proceed as a trial on an issue, basically an issue of whether we were signatories or not. The other communities claimed were put in abeyance and uh, Big Tagong basically led the way. So in 2016, 2017, Big Tagong in Ontario and Canada uh, agreed to enter into without prejudice settlement and negotiations. Uh, in 2017, 2019, uh, we started community consultations and land use planning and we came up with a settlement vision uh, that we shared with Ontario and with Canada and uh, with uh, uh, other communities and industry as well. And in 2020, uh, uh, in order to provide interim protection for priority lands, Ontario passed a mining claim withdrawal order within our um, area that we wanted to protect uh, for future land use. Uh, next slide. And uh, for those who don't know uh, precisely what Aboriginal title means, basically, this is an ex a quick explanation based on Haida Nation versus British Columbia. Uh, um, Canada's Aboriginal people were here when Europeans came and were never conquered. Many bands reconciled their claims with the sovereignty of crown for negotiated treaties. We never signed a treaty. We were not signatories. There were only three signatories to uh, the Robinson Superior uh, Treaty, actually. 
uh, the potential right to embeddedness claims are protected in the section 35 of the Constitution Act 1932. The honor of the Crown requires that your rights be determined, recognized, and respected. This in turn requires the Crown acting honorably to participate in the process of negotiation. While this process continues, the honor of the Crown may require to consult and where indicated accommodate Aboriginal interests. And, uh, and uh, the need to accommodate is higher when there's an Aboriginal title uh, claim. Uh, next slide. This is basically our, our, our land. The next slide. And when you look at this outline here is what's our, what we call our exclusive title area. There's another line that we have on the map. I'm not going to show it here, but uh, uh, what the overlaps with the uh, surrounding communities, uh, Pick Mobert uh, to the east, uh, uh, Long Lake 58 uh, north, and Pace Platt uh, to the west. But this is what Beek Tagong asserts as the ex exclusive title area. Uh, next slide. In, 19, uh, in 1970s, uh, uh, Pakistan National Park was created. There was also uh, there's numerous. Uh, uh, provincial parks, uh, Slate Islands, Nays, uh, Red Sucker, uh, 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 Craig's Pit, and uh, the Lands for Life process was also created a whole bunch of other conservation areas and, and parks, and Big Town was never ever consulted uh, in the creation of those parks. Next slide. Uh, Ontario recently announced, uh, made an announcement of a protected areas working group. This group here supposedly is going to look at uh, uh, the creation of new parks. It is Beak Tagong's hope that we don't see the same type of thing that happened back in the creation of the Lands for Life that this group starts uh, creating parks without consulting with the First Nations, and particularly with the First Nations who have Aboriginal title. So uh, well, I, we have concerns about this group and what they're planning to do. Uh, next slide. Uh, Big Tagong uh, <clears throat> and their vision in regards to uh, the land claim and their title area uh, want to protect the waterways. Uh, we uh, have a policy that we uh, we take a balanced approach in regards to protecting land and uh, development. We're not against development, but we want to balance that out with protecting our areas and, uh, and in particular our waterways. Uh, this uh, uh, waterways, uh, the White River, uh, we are trying to get withdrawals along all our major waterways one kilometer on each side of each waterway. Uh, this is the White River. The White River, again, the historical route to get inland to the, to the White Lake area, but there's also connecting canoe routes that take you down through uh, uh, the magpie system to Michigan. So there's a whole system. I'm not going to show you them here, but those are historical uh, kind of routes. Uh, next slide. And this is the Black River, Mukdezi V. Uh, again, a, a historical uh, kind of route to get uh, into the Manitowoc area and then north uh, 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 towards the Nagagni. Uh, again, we're looking for one kilometer of, uh, of protection on each side of all these rivers. Uh, next slide. Uh, Big Tig ZB, uh, that's the Pick River. Uh, uh, again, uh, historical canoe kind of route to connect us with our friends uh, uh, in the north. There's 
good connections with uh, Long Lot 58, and we have a lot of relatives up in 58, and that was because of this river. Uh, historical records show that it took five days to go up, but uh, three days to come down. In 2016, uh, I canoed that right from Long Lac uh, uh, down to Lake Superior. It took us 10 days, but we took our time. We didn't try to park it. Uh, we spent the whole summer in 2015 cleaning up the porges on the river. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, white Otter, Orcs Garden Gig, ZV. Uh, again, uh, the White Otter uh, was used by our, by our people uh, uh, to get to James Bay. Uh, you go up the, 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 the pick in the White Otter, uh, part of the over the height of land in the garden system, and then down to the Albany. Uh, Old Peter Moses claimed that it would take him one month to get to to uh, James Bay uh, from Peck River, uh, and then coming back would take him six weeks, so two weeks longer because of the current on the Albany. Uh, next slide. And uh, Little Peck River, uh, meet the Grand CB. Again, uh, 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 a major uh, route for us to get into Kalala Lake and into Kagiana. Uh, next slide. Wash goes in uh, ZB, basically Blue Stoon River. Uh, that's uh, our traditional name for that system. Uh, it's called the Steel now. Uh, that was our named for that system, the lake and the river. Uh, we're looking for protection here on, again, um, around the lake and the river, because the river go, the lake goes north and then turns and comes south. Uh, so we're looking for protection for the whole system. And uh, again, this, uh, uh, right now is not protected uh, to the extent that we think it should be protected. Uh, the province uh, has a provincial park there, but uh, 120 meters, I believe, uh, on the side of the river, which is nothing. We're, we're proposing basically uh, on each side of that, uh, again, uh, one kilometer. Next slide. And that would connect us to uh, basically the Slate Islands and the Caribou Ridge on the Slate Island. And hopefully uh, would provide some travel routes for the Caribou. Next slide. Again, this is, this is uh, the province and the N NFMC's uh, plan for Caribou. Uh, that orange area is the coastal area for caribou. There's nothing left there. Um, uh, Forgotten First Nation and uh, a group of biologists did a study along the North Shore and they couldn't find any uh, caribou there this winter. Uh, we do they did find deer in three different places, including on one island. Uh, the brown area is what the province and the NFMC has uh, designated for caribou refuge. Uh, we think it's not adequate because the uh, forest is not old enough. Uh, the purple area is supposed to be travel corridors. Uh, uh, again, uh, with the province, these are only protected for 20 years and then they, and they get moved. So what happens? Uh, What's supposed to happen, uh, and how does the how does the caribou know, know that uh, that old area is going to be cut? Then there's no new areas, so we're looking at permanent uh, uh, protection, particular in that steel bluestone area just north of Slate Islands. Uh, um, next slide, and when you overlay that with uh, you overlay that with uh, 
the protection zones that uh, we're trying to do, you'll see that uh, there's a lot more that we uh, are trying to protect on a permanent basis. And then particular uh, the Bluestone River, or Wash Kuzin GB, uh, because it's right north of Slate Island, and Slate Island is now uh, have the last little remaining herd of uh, caribou. There's about 30 there right now. Uh, there's some plans to transfer caribou over to Mitch Pecotton, but there was a couple of wolves left on Mitch Pecotton, and they wanted to make sure that those wolves were not there before they transferred caribou over. So uh, uh, when you look at uh, what we're trying to do, we're trying to do two things. We're trying to protect our water zones, but we're also trying to create a permanent habitat for caribou and caribou zone. Uh, next slide. And again, uh, you look at it uh, within our traditional area. Those are all the zones uh, all together. Next slide. And this in particular is the Washoe uh, Sin ZB, the Bluestone River Indigenous Park. Uh, when you look at the indigenous, indigenous parks and legislation to create the indigenous parks, there's no legislation whatsoever. They, they throw that word around all the time. There's no legislation in the province. There's no legislation in, in, uh, in uh, the federal government. Uh, and in, in Parks Canada. Parks Canada created that ICE report in regards to Indigenous parks and it sits on a shelf somewhere gathering dust. Uh, 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 there's no legislation to be able to create those things and that needs to change. Uh, next slide. And again, um, putting them all together, uh, this is our vision basically for some of the protected areas and uh, how we want to protect our waterways and the creation of uh, uh, indigenous parks to protect caribou as well. Uh, next slide. And that's it. And again, uh, that's the signs we put on our forge, uh, forges that uh, we cleaned out on the steel, uh, the pick river as well. We're trying to get the little pick done this summer. COVID put a, a stop to our stuff last summer, uh, but we're trying to get moving again this summer, but it's slow because there's still a lot of issues in regard to COVID. Uh, Miigwech, thanks for listening. Uh, hope uh, you have some insight now into what Big Tagang is trying to do in regards to protection of the areas to a Miigwech. Thank you, Chief Duncan. That was incredible. And I know I personally, as a freshwater professional, really appreciate the focus on the rivers. I think um, it's sometimes we, over, um, we don't consider that the rivers can be a core part of what gets protected. So that focus is wonderful. And on a very personal note, it was Manitowoc that I lived in, and I never thought I'd be in my professional life in a meeting where Manitowoc was ever spoken about. So um, thank you yeah. for my the trip down memory lane. Yeah, we're trying to work with Manitowoc uh, to do something about the Upper Black in regards to some of the Canelos. It is beautiful country. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, next up, Mark, Program Director for Central Ontario Nature Conservancy of Canada. Let's hear about the Rice, um, the Rice Lake Plains Partnership. Great, thanks. Uh, welcome and hello everyone out there. Thanks to uh, the former presenters, great sessions. Uh, so Dave, you're doing my slides, are you? So I'll be saying fire away, just in the spirit of tall grass restoration when it comes to slides. So thanks for having me here at this session. Uh, you know, honored to be here. Um, I'd like to talk about a long-standing partnership that Nature Conservancy of Canada has been involved with in the Rice Lake Plains, uh, some of the accomplishments of the partners, uh, and some of the benefits that we've seen have come from this, and some future next steps. Fire away. Uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, a long-standing land trust, proud member of a land trust community across Canada. Uh, we're into strategic habitat conservation, uh, partnerships, 
and uh, hopefully exemplary land stewardship of the properties that we steward. Uh, we've been involved with a lot of uh, partnerships and protection uh, of land across the country with a whole variety of partners, including Indigenous partners, um, and have been involved in a lot of land conservation in the province as well, about 84,000 hectares directly um, involving NCC. Uh, we're currently fundraising for a beautiful property in Prince Edward County, and we have a num number of other projects underway. Um, happy to talk with you about them afterwards as well. Fire away. The area we're in this map has green blobs, and those broad blobs represent natural area conservation plans where NCC focuses much or most of its work in Ontario and across the country. The area I want to speak about is Rice Lake Plains in red, fire away. That was a historic tall grass ecosystem uh, identified by early land surveyors and confirmed by uh, uh, First Nations history and so on. Uh, this was actually a Wazel uh, famous map, now recently updated to show where not forest, not wetland, but open habitats like savanna, tall grass prairie existed in that landscape on the Oak Ridge Moraine. Fire away. It was a historic landscape, not of forest, but of open habitats that were sustained by indigenous burning and by natural fire as well. It's high and dry in the Oak Ridge Moraine, so the sandy habitat also support uh, these sort of conditions, the easternmost tall grass prairie landscape in the country. Fire away. Uh, that uh, picture behind me, I'm calling you, I'm talking to you from Uxbridge, but this is the Hazelbird Nature Reserve in the uh, Rice Lake Plains. Uh, it's actually the area I added to the map for the People's Summit Protected Areas map if folks want to check it out. So just a quick review, uh, the tall grass ecosystem represent, is represented by a number of community types, including sand barren, fire away, tall grass prairie, which uh, often people think as the tall grass community, but also other habitats that are uh, linked together by tall grass indicator species, including oak savanna, fire away, and uh, oak woodland, fire away. And each represent is, is identified by the uh, forest or canopy cover, but particularly these tall grass indicator species of grasses, herbaceous species, and shrubs, fire away. Uh, and we do know that it was historically much more widespread in Ontario, but also around the US. And there are very few, relative to what once was across North America, very few remnants left. Uh, lots of uh, stellar work done in Walpole First Island, in the Grand River area, uh, across southwestern Ontario to restore these habitats. And we're, uh, I'm going to talk about the work that these part partners are doing to restore it in the Bryce Lake Plains area, fire away. Our guiding light for what to do right has always been all the both First Nation Black Oak Savannah, uh, the best managed and best example of a remnant tall grass prairie landscape in the area. Uh, it was our go-to place to learn more about um, what the tall grass prairie remnant that was there and how to restore it. And we uh, benefited very much from the Elder Rick Beaver and other members of First Nation and the Black Oak Savannah project in particular to help guide our work in, in properties that we've secured and other partners have secured afterwards, fire away. About 15 years ago or more, uh, the Nature Conservancy of Canada worked with other partners to try and uh, build a partnership to help create a bigger landscape impact in that Bryce Lake Plains uh, area on top of the Oak Ridges Moraine, including land trusts, conservation authorities, provincial government, uh, other organizations like Tallgrass Ontario, and, and uh, membership has changed over the years. Uh, Alderville First Nation uh, joined uh, soon after the partnerships uh, began. Uh, the Black Oak Savannah Project in particular uh, has been a very active participant in this partnership. Um, we have had local naturalist clubs as well as, as now uh, the educational community is joining us as well. Fire away. And this is, this is our, 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 what ties us together is often a common interest in land that has tall grass communities on it. But what we really want to achieve, fire away, is a generation of tall grass huggers. You've heard of tree huggers. This, we want to get tall grass huggers, people who are in love with and want to restore this amazing, amazing uh, ecosystem in the Rice Lake Plains and beyond. Fire away. Uh, we've done uh, many things over the years to uh, collaborate. We had a lot of early days, we had a, work, a lot of work on communication and outreach to help build a broad awareness for uh, the tall grass ecosystem that's in the neighborhood of many people in, in, that, uh, in that county, of Northumberland County, uh, including newsletters. Now we have the Facebook page. Actually, it's very act fairly active. Want to check that out. 
and also a, web, a website where we give some background as to how we've been collaborating and working together. We've done a lot of fundraising to support individual projects, but also larger partnership efforts such as landowner outreach workshops and that kind of thing. Um, and it's and it's we've come together. We've been together for many years. There have been kind of marriages that have come out of some of the partnerships. And in fact, uh, one of the land where there's a merger of two land trusts that's occurring uh, that are being part of this this uh, initiative. Fire away. Uh, we and one of the things we do is celebrate the ecosystem a lot. Celebrate achievements in terms of land uh, protection, uh, restoration efforts. Uh, top rate uh, for many years, all the First Nations hosted Prairie Day, where they welcomed us to the First Nation to uh, celebrate uh, the wonderful ecosystem, the things that people are doing to restore it. Um, more recently, in bottom right, we've had an annual Hazel Bird Day around International Migratory Bird Day to celebrate achievements of conservation volunteers and, and restoration efforts in that area. Uh, so we like to have fun and we like to celebrate uh, things that are, are really good about that landscape. Fire away, please. Um, but then our core work is identifying and protecting and restoring tall grass elements. Uh, this is our Hazelbird Nature Reserve with some of our crew, fire away. And there's all kinds of background information. Tall Grass Ontario, for example, has done a lot to uh, help amass information about tall grass remnants, the provincial government, as well as First Nations. We're always looking for these key indicator species. For example, the black oak uh, or white oak you see, see above, uh, prairie uh, buttercup, tall uh, big blue stem, uh, butterfly weed, and others. Fire away. And once those remnants have been identified, uh, a number of organizations have been working to protect that area. These areas. This one in particular is a, an eco gift, an ecological gift donation of uh, land called the Bar Nature Reserve, beautiful oak savanna uh, site. Actually, this is, has been restored. It was not in this condition with the tall grass in it and a uh, degree of health um, through fires, etc. We've, we've been restoring that over the years. Fire away. Here's a map showing kind of the network of some of the protected lands that we've uh, collectively put together over the years. Uh, some dark green being nature conservancy sites, other uh, land trust work like the Northumberland Land Trust and Lone Pine Land Trust, and they're, um, they're merging, which is very exciting to kind of have a greater impact. Uh, conservation authorities, Ontario Parks with Peters Woods Provincial Park, uh, and the Burnley Carmel additions to that. And in the pink area, you'll see the Alderville First Nation uh, lands, within which is that amazing Alderville First Nation Black Oak Savannah site. The, Brownish area in between is a Northumberland County forest, and there has been we involved in a large effort to identify key uh, tall grass remnants in there. And the county forest is now uh, managing those through fires, burning, and other approaches as well. Fire away. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, we were proud to be able to help raise money to uh, increase the size of the Alderville First Nation Black Oak Savannah site. Uh, we helped acquire, helped the First Nation acquire a certificate of possession of a band member that added lands to the Black Oak Savannah protected site. Uh, and this was a celebration we had uh, that day where our drummers and dancers came to the site. Uh, on the right, you see Elder Rick Beaver, who's been our, our, our sort of elder teacher and friend to help us learn so much about how to do uh, tall grass restoration. And in the middle is now Chief Dave Moyd, who was involved with the Black Oak Savannah establishment. Uh, and we're laughing our heads off here because we gave him the sign, please break for snakes. And at that time he was terrified of snakes. And he since told me he has now picked up a snake and he was really proud of that achievement. Uh, fire away, please. So though the land needs hands um, in, in terms of tall grass ecosystems, they need uh, fire and, and they need people looking after it if it's gonna be retained on the landscape. So many sites that we've been involved with have very few remnants or remnants have been degraded by loss of lack of fire, of uh, planting of conifer species, invasive species, et cetera. So uh, all of us are committed to restoration to, this, to restore and sustain these communities into the future. And this, this is the UN decade for ecosystem restoration. And there, I love their hashtag, generation restoration. And that, that's where hopefully we're all part of that. Fire away. So I'll just go through some of this, the activities that really all the partners are involved with to some degree. Um, and what's really key to this is a, a growing network of volunteers that have been sort of languishing during COVID, but we're ready to get this army of volunteers back up and running again to help us all do more uh, stewardship work. And for those in the tall grass world, you'll recognize the 
the orangey red grass of the tall grass, big blue stem Indian grass, or the switch grass, uh, little blue stem, et cetera. This is the Hazelbird Nature's Fireway. Uh, some of the activities uh, are, are pretty heavy duty. Scotch pine was planted over some of the bare sands to uh, restore the, the land after it had been cleared and then uh, blew away with, with blow sands on the Oak Ridge and Moraine. So Scotch pine did help for a period of time, but now it's actually become uh, like a, a weed kind of growing across many natural areas. So we've removed a lot of Scotch pine, fire away, and uh, are now creating that as a stage to help grassland and eventually tall grass to be restored at those sites. Look what on the right, you'll see these are some of the plantations that are skewing forth the uh, Scotch pine regeneration into our the adjacent nature reserve. So uh, we have our eyes on that property to the right. We've made offers, but uh, we're in it for the long term and hopefully one of these days we'll be able to tackle that site as well. Fire away. And here's an example of a uh, formerly open grown oak that had been completely enveloped by Scotch pine and now removed and ready to spread its wings once again and to hopefully create more acorns for more oaks as well. Fire away. And of course, we talk here a lot about seed, the need for seed. Uh, we do a lot of uh, planting and seeding uh, and growing seed to create plugs to plant, uh, fire away. And we do it again, and we do it again. And we, one of the things that's really great is having volunteers collect seed for us. And we are now looking at ways to increase more seed production sites. I think uh, I heard Tim's Talbot talk about the seed crop idea. We were looking at that as well. So I look forward to maybe chatting with Daria about your success, because we're working on that uh, right now with a uh, Caroline in Canada representative as well about uh, seed strategies, that sort of thing. Fire away. Uh, we do some plant plugs and just want to say that even the suits get involved with, with seeding in the Rice Lake Plains. Fire away. And of course we do uh, prescribed burns uh, in a careful controlled manner, but we have a, had a long established uh, prescribed burn program. Uh, at, you know, all the First Nations have been burning and for, uh, former, you know, inhabitants have been burning for many, many generations. Uh, we're now reapplying that, that fire cycle to the land, fire away. And uh, just to show that we were early adopters of the mass, as you know, fire away. Uh, uh, oaks like black oak in particular, and black oak is a savanna, black oak woodland, tall grass prairie are globally significant habitats. They're adapted to fire, uh, so ground fires, which these prescribed fires are, are, uh, are able to knock back the regeneration and allow uh, the black oak and then the tall grass species to flourish. Fire away. And of course, we tackle them bases, I know a lot of them. Um, spotted knapweed is a particular nasty one that has come in after overgrazing of sites um, that has prevents other species from coming in. We have a very concerted effort at, at tackling those at all of our properties, fire away. And again, it comes back to the sort of the people and people who can help us out. In the foreground, this is John O'Neill, and he's actually uh, donating another 96 acres to add to the 300 acre Hazelbird Nature Reserve. Um, and that's, the, that's the, the area I posted on, on the People Summit map. Really excited about that. Uh, he's a, a, a volunteer, he helps us do restoration. And he can't wait for us to get our hands on his property to, to open up the scotch pine that has been uh, develop, enveloping his land as well. Fire away. So some of the things that have happened, things that uh, you're uh, helping to awaken the tall grass site after the burns, after seeding, after planting, plants like the yellow pimpernel, which had never been identified on the site in our property management plan and baseline inventory. Next thing you know, after several burns, large population has emerged there. We have uh, new populations of uh, wild lupin as well that have, have been known to be at Hazelbird, hadn't been there again until um, fire and, and some planting has come there as well, fire away. Uh, here's that spotted knapweed field in Hazelbird to the above, which uh, through a variety of techniques involving help from a local farmer with tilling and tilling and various other techniques and seeding, it's now a tall grass prairie a site that is a site for seed for us to use at other locations. Also great grassland bird habitat, fire away. Uh, Salt Creek Nature Reserve, former Scotch pine plantation, now amazing population of cylindrical basing star, one of the biggest in the region. And, and the butterflies in this site are unbelievable, fire away. So just, just an example of, of uh, you know, pollinators have been really enjoying this particular site. But again, 
there was a population there before, but it really exploded with these treatments. It was just awaiting uh, that helping hand to, to move ahead far away. Another species at risk far away, this is New Jersey tea, which really benefits from uh, the fires and restoration work that's underway, uh, and which is uh, the, the, the feeding site for the caterpillars of the model dusky wing. And we now have uh, populations confirmed and flying over all of our, our properties now in, in the Bryce Lake Plains and other par partners as well. And just a reminder that the things that I'm talking about again is, I could talk from our perspective, many of the partners are employing these same techniques in, in properties across the Rice Lake Plains fire away. And you know, one of our targets is to help uh, bring back the grassland birds. And just this year in Hazel Bird Nature Reserve, for example, we had Eastern Meadowlark uh, confirmed. Now it's on territory, we haven't got the data yet, um, but it had not been there before because it had, just was not open enough. The, the scotch pine had moved in uh, and other species. So we're seeing the response um, and, it's, and it's measurable and, and it's really heartening. Fire away. There's also, also carbon benefits. You may have heard that earlier. Mark, in, I'm just going to call one more minute. Yep, very good. Yep, Car and they were almost done. So carbon storage because of the wonderful grass roots that are there. Fire away. And also benefits local economies because we do hire a lot of folks to help us with this work, fire away. And finally, connecting people with the land. We love having people out to these sites. We encourage you to come. Uh, there's a website that's in the, the People Summit map uh, about the Hazelbird Nature Reserve, and we encourage you to come and join us um, at our site, fire away. Um, so we're, we have a larger plan underway. We're teamed up with Tallgrass Ontario. And again, uh, we're very proud to continue our work with all the First Nation, the Black Oak Savannah, uh, and hopefully together we'll do even more uh, good things down the road. Thanks very much for having me. So, so fantastic. Thanks. I, I, I had the double duty of being receiver and clicker, so I'd be engrossed <laughs> in what's going on. And then, oh yeah, okay, fire away. So I hope I, I, I didn't delay. I thought it was pretty quick, but there was a, a mechanical delay there. Um, we had some questions for uh, uh, Tamara. Did she make it back or is she still away? So I won't go to those questions if she's not here. I honestly. don't think she's made it back yet. I know she was doing court, so. Yeah, yeah I know. She was hoping to make it back. Um, really appreciate all the presentations are fascinating. As I said, <laughs> distracting from my main job, that'd be the clicker. Um, and and the, the variety of the landscape all the way from from Lake Superior into the, the uh, Rice Lake Plains and, and uh, Southwestern Ontario, it was, just, it, it was an amazing scope. I'm gonna ask Chief uh, Machano, Chief Duncan, um, and, and I'm, I'm assuming you're still on, I can't see you on my screen, but you're still here. Yep, I'm still here. Yeah, I, uh, one, one question uh, was about uh, coordination with Bishop Cotton First Nation, because as you mentioned, and, and I know uh, they've been very involved in, in trying to maintain and restore caribou in the, in the Lake Superior Islands. Uh, I'm just wondering if you'd say a bit more about any, any um, coordination with them uh, and cooperation with what they're trying to do from your community. It's complex. Because, <clears throat> because uh, there's no issue in regards to uh, trying to do to coordinate with Mitch Picotton. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Chief Tanji and I have talked about that specific thing. MECP in the province is the issue. Mm. They're trying to, uh, in, in what way? Well, uh, dealing with different groups separately that that's the issue uh, of uh, Mitch Picotton and Beak Tagong would work well together if we could ever get MECP uh, uh, and the province to sit down at the table with both of us together. That and would that, make sense. Uh, yeah, um, because one of the things that we we have talked about, uh, Beak Tagong and Mitch Picotton is actually using uh, the Slate Islands and Mitch Picotton Island as uh, nursery habitat, uh, basically for, to make sure that those caribou don't disappear altogether. And at some point in the future, I don't know when that'll be, I probably won't be around, uh, uh, when conditions uh, change or are right, 
to start introducing the caribou back to the mainland, and, and particularly in Paxaw National Park, where uh, they disappeared altogether. Uh, uh, I've got my, uh, 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 I guess, uh, ideas about why they've uh, disappeared from Paxaw National Park. I won't uh, um, express those here because uh, of different reasons, but. Uh, uh, I worked in Paxaw National Park for 36 years uh, uh, until I became chief in 2013. Uh, so um, I know if the management policies are there. But uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, the, the initiative between Mitch Picotten and uh, Big Town will probably happen at some time in the future. We just got to get the province. Uh, to get on board and stop playing games. Great. Well, congratulations on your work. Um, I'm going to go to another question. Um, do the Chippewas of the Thames consider their protected area an IPCA? So that's for uh, for Annabelle, I guess. Um, so we don't consider it that. We don't qualify for the federal funding and to be considered under that category because we don't have enough lands to put towards what would qualify. So we did our own 250 acres, but it wasn't enough to qualify for that federal um, title hmm. of our lands. So what, what is the threshold, if, if you don't mind? That I do not know. <laughs> I am less than a month in this position. Okay. So I learned a lot by preparing for this presentation and um, it's definitely something I can follow up on yeah. as well, too. Well, that's that's great, and thanks for your presentation. And uh, I have another question, uh, if we have time. I think we got a few more minutes uh, for the broader group that's working on tall grass prairie. Um, and and Annabelle is actually your I think your slide about um, restoring along the Thames there. How long does it take from say bare earth to have a you know fairly functioning tall grass tall grass prairie um, you know, kind of up and up and running, so to speak. And uh, any of you tall grass folks can answer that question. But uh, Mark here, I, I just, uh, I didn't get to the last slide. So I didn't get to thank Val Daziel, who's our biologist working on that project and, and many volunteers and funders for our, our program. Uh, so we've had one field, the one that went from knapweed to that field, that took about 10 years. So we had uh, the nappy, there were scotch pines actually before that um, we to get, and we've had, it was tall grass to some degree before, but not in that kind of thriving condition. So um, from, from assessment to uh, put the plan together to initial uh, treatment, uh, and every site has a different site preparation uh, regime, and then seeding uh, and monitoring and seeding again and seeding again. In that case, we're, we're, that one's ready for a burn now. Um, but from beginning of getting the property to the point where it's at, that took 10 years, but with a concerted effort, it could be much more truncated if you're successful uh, in some of our places in the Southwest where they're going from uh, 100 year fields that have been farmed and sprayed with herbicide and everything, you know, really took taken everything away. You're sorry from a, a, free, a blank slate. It can be much truncated, maybe four years or so to, to get that site up and running. Or maybe Daria can have another experience. Yeah, I would say for the um, areas that we've worked at where you're starting really with a with a blank field, um, we usually use a cover crop in the first year just because a lot of the native prairie species, even if they germinate, they're just very tiny plants the first year. So we uh, usually use a cover crop. Um, and then the second year, boom, they're up. Um, and so they will be, we have flowering of a lot of the native wildflowers um, and prairie plants in the second year. And by the third and fourth year, yeah, you wouldn't know that it wasn't. Um, so from that perspective, visually, it looks um, very much like a tall grass prairie very quickly or um, a prairie or a meadow. Um, but when Mark showed that picture of the roots um, and the depth and stuff, um, I have heard that to get to really a climax prairie again, just the way that we think about a forest um, community, it can take 100 years for those relationships to develop and those roots to develop and for all of the ecosystem processes that function within that prairie to really return to full. Um, so even though it looks um, done right away, um, it certainly looks pretty and, and flowering, 
um, it can take a little while for all of the interactions to come back, um, just like you would expect that in a forest restoration project. Thanks for that. Um, I'm just going to do a time check with Elizabeth. I think we have a couple more minutes. Is that right? Yeah, I would squeeze. Maybe let's squeeze in one, and I'll do my thank yous. Will be very quick. I just okay. I and one. I got a, a text that Tamara was trying to get back into the meeting. I don't know if she made it. No. Don't see her yet. Okay, so I was just wondering if anybody quickly from the panel had a question for any other panel members because it was also interesting. I have a question for Daria. I saw this great slide with youth and they're going like this. What was that? Those are Western students. <laughs> University <laughs> of Western Ontario um, came out on a volunteer event actually to help us remove buckthorn and make room for uh, native plants in a, in a forest habitat. So um, yes, they were very excited. It was part of their orientation. So they were first year Western students. Cool. The, the cultural aspect of <laughs> frustration. Uh, Maybe we should go to um, back to our moderator, Elizabeth, and yes. uh, with thank yous and wrapping up. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. That was a really terrific morning. It just sped by for me. I really heard, again, I heard this yesterday when I was on a panel. Uh, I was in Dave's role yesterday, and just the riches, like, so inspiring. And I think it's so easy to forget the riches we have in this province. And it's a really beautiful thing when people so passionate like yourselves are so engaged and are able to bring in the public in different ways, right? Like I think there is so much engagement and it's we forget and people are so keen to restore and recognize that nature is so important. And I think one of the gifts of COVID is that people are, it's heightened right now, the engagement in nature. And then I guess the other theme I really heard was the importance of regional impact, you know, protecting, Mara spoke about the importance of protecting um, Lake Erie and that conservation marine park, because those birds fly north to the lower Hudson Bay, James Bay. And so when we do impact in our backyard, which is what we love to do, everyone wants to protect their community, it does have these added benefits across the province. And I think, um, you know, it's so important for humans to feel like they belong and be a part of a bigger story. And I think he really was highlighted in today's presentation. So I really wanna thank all the speakers, Dave, thank you so much. And thank Wildlands for allowing me to be a part of this story. It was um, incredibly inspiring and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the summit. Thank you. I think the hook's gonna come Thanks, and everyone. check us out. <laughs> Thanks very much. Be good. I enjoyed Thank all you. those presentations, especially those ones about the tall grass prairies. Those that's kind of interesting. Anyway.